With any video game series becoming popular with audiences, having spin-off titles is one way of expanding a franchise's global reach. Over the last 25 years of its existence, we've seen its fair share of spin-off titles, each one with a similar or drastically different gameplay with an active audience they can call their own. But there's one series that's often remembered the most, one that's popular among the other spin-off titles, and that series is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Developed by Spike Chunsoft, formerly known as just Chunsoft before they merged with Spike in 2012, the reason why I and probably many others got into the mainline series to begin with was the Pokemon themselves. The story is good or decent at best, but catching these creatures and building a team around them is what helps the player form a strong bond with them. So to have a spin-off series where the Mons are the game's primary focus and no humans appear in it makes it a great experience for those people. While all the games carry on the same trope, each entry takes a different route in using the trope as a launch point. The stories they tell were unique for their time, and the gameplay, while not everyone's favorite style, remains good and has so much replay value to it. So in this video, I want to look back on all four Mystery Dungeon games from Rescue Team, Explorers, Gates to Infinity, and Super Mystery Dungeon. Whether it's talking about the story, its mechanics, or the overall gameplay. I'm not including the Japanese exclusive WiiWare games since they're not like the other titles in the series, I've personally never played them, and the only way of accessing an English version is to use a fan translation that a group of fans made a few years back. Getting that translation would require me to mod my Wii and install Homebrew on it, which I'm not willing to risk accidentally breaking my only console. So with that out of the way, let's begin with the first game in the series. Being the first game released in the series, Red and Blue Rescue Team for the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS was first released in 2005 in Japan and North America a year later. And in my opinion, this game is the weakest but also difficult entry, mostly because it's fundamentally flawed with how inconvenient it was at the time, having issues that later installments would fix and expand upon. These games are based on a classic roguelike game, with the player navigating a party through a randomly generated dungeon with their Pokemon team. Every movement and action is turn-based, where the player can use basic attacks, Pokemon moves, and items. This kind of gameplay is a mixed bag among the community. Some people enjoy it for how much replay value it has, while others dislike it for how repetitive and boring it can be. I fall in the middle of the argument where I enjoy it for what it is, but I'm also not extremely obsessed with it. In this case, people aren't playing Pokemon Mystery Dungeon for its gameplay, we're mostly here for the story. Nowadays, the plot for Rescue Team is as basic as a bar of soap, and future entries would tell better plots overall. Still, when this game was released back then, it was unheard of that a Pokemon game could tackle topics such as being a fugitive and forgiveness of past sins, among many others. Upon starting a new game, you're greeted with a personality quiz you must take. The questions themselves are the standard ones that most people would be asked for. After answering the questions and choosing a gender, you'll be assigned to a type that describes you best, and depending on your type will determine which Pokemon you'll play as. Instead of a 10 year old human kid who sets off on a journey across the region to collect 8 gym badges, stop the evil organization, beat the Elite Four and become champion, you're a human who one day wakes up in an unfamiliar world, is turned into a Pokemon and has amnesia. Your partner finds you unconscious in a place called Tiny Woods, and upon giving each other your respective names, a Butterfree flies through begging for help as her baby Caterpie is lost within a cavern and isn't able to get out by herself. Once you finish the tutorial dungeon, you and your partner find the lost Caterpie and bring her back to her mother safely, where you are rewarded with valuable items and some money. Your partner asks you to follow them and they bring you to your very own base, where it serves as a hub world and you can save your progress inside the little hut. I won't spoil what happens after the two of you form an exploration team and begin your real journey, the story becomes more interesting as time goes on. It establishes elements and characters that would make the player feel invested the more they play the game, and despite the main campaign being short, it doesn't overstay its welcome and ties nearly everything together by the end of it. Only one key component within the story does get its resolution in the post game. If you're someone who's played the original GBA slash DS release or the Nintendo Switch remake of Rescue Team, then you know. In the end, PMD1 serves as a decent starting point for the series. The story may not be amazing nowadays, but it gives you a good taste of what's to come in future installments while making you feel the weight of the impending doom later on with good writing for its time. The characters are amazing with the dialogue to accompany them, the amazing soundtrack to boot, and gameplay that can be a mixed bag but fun enough to give you determination to see through the end.
After the success of Red and Blue Rescue Team, selling 5.85 million copies in total, the developers quickly got to work on a sequel, and in 2007, the world was introduced to Explorers of Time and Darkness for the DS. These games, especially the enhanced Explorers of Sky version, are widely considered to not only be the best entry in the PMD series, but also one of the best Pokemon games ever made. Some claim it can stand alongside mainline and remake games like Heart Gold, Soul Silver, Platinum, and even Black and White and its sequels. If you were to go up to any fan and ask them, what's the best or first mystery dungeon game you've played? A large majority of people will say Explorers of Sky, and for good reason. Across all three versions, they're relatively the same, but for the sake of avoiding any confusion, I'll mostly be talking about the Sky version of PMD2. Between the two versions, the roster of Pokemon you can choose during the personality quiz has expanded thanks to the sequels including Generation 4 mods introduced in Diamond and Pearl. However, the two Pokemon, Munchlax and Meowth, can't be the player character and can only be chosen as partners. Aside from the starters, Fanfi, Fulvix, Riolu, and Shinx are four new characters that can be assigned as the player or partner. Certain dialogue is slightly different between the two versions, five special episodes are introduced, and each one can be unlocked as you make progress. This is where you play as certain side characters the player meets throughout the main and post campaign and look into their backstory. The Sky version adds new locations and dungeons such as Spindus Cafe, Shaman Village, and Destiny Tower. When the introduction screen for each chapter is shown, each each one now shows an image in the background based on what will happen as opposed to a black screen with white text. The Luxray and Luxio tribe that was the boss of the Amp Plains dungeon in Time and Darkness has been replaced by the Manetric and Electric tribe in the Sky version, due to one of the playable Pokemon being Shinx. These are just many of the quality of life improvements and addition that Time and Darkness and Sky implemented from the first game, and it gives the series more life than ever before. But the one thing that everyone remembers this game for is the phenomenal story. The writing has drastically improved between the first and second games, being much longer and having better pacing that doesn't stall or stray away from subplots. All of the characters, main, side, or NPCs makes Explorers a living, breathing world that's believable. Most of them have personalities that are lovable and stick to the audience, plus they all react to whatever events are going on in the story. The dialogue the dialogue has comic relief and jokes that'll make you laugh, warm scenes that will win your empathy for the characters, and heavy moments that'll make you feel horrible. The story begins with a cutscene where the player winds up unconscious on a beach due to a time-traveling accident, causing them to nearly lose their memories and becoming a Pokemon. Meanwhile, the partner is nervous about joining Wigglytub's guild, a local exploration club, and gives up early. Walking along the beach, the partner encounters the player and informs them on their circumstance. The relic fragment the partner has been holding onto is then stolen by a Zubat and Coughing, two Pokemon who were eavesdropping the partner earlier. After venturing into the game's tutorial dungeon, Beach Cave, and retrieving the fragment from the thieves, the partner explains their motivation for joining the guild. It's revealed that they love legends and lore and their life's dream is to find the secret of their personal treasure. The partner, reinvigorated by the player's courage, resolves to join the guild as a new team with the player. Due to them having severe memory loss that erases everything from their past life except their name and the knowledge that they were once a human, they agree as a way to piece together who they were. From there, the story focuses on the two newly recruited guild members as they explore many dungeons, help innocent Pokemon in need, meet many characters good and bad, and slowly uncover the truth behind the player's amnesia and the partner's relic fragment, all while saving the world from a permanent paralysis future from occurring. Explorers is everything that Rescue Team establishes cranked up to 11. Everything from the story, characters, gameplay, quality of life improvements, and the soundtrack makes this game well beloved by everybody in the PMD community. So much so that a lot of fan art and fan fictions you can find online are based around Explorers of Sky. I highly recommend anyone who's never played Mystery Dungeon to give all four of these games a try, especially this one. You won't regret it. Despite the success of Explorers reaching 6.37 million copies, the next installment in the PMD series would take place in 2013 for North America. By that time, the mainline series was near the end of its fifth generation with preparations underway for the next entry, Pokemon X and Y. At this point, the original Chunsoft devs have already merged with Spike to form the company they're known today, and the spin-off games would transition from 2D sprite work to full 3D in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Gates to Infinity. I remember when this game was released and received a lot of negative reception from its fans. So many people hated this game for its boring plot and the lack of content compared to the first two games. When you start a new game, there are two issues that should already be a red flag. The personality quiz from before is completely removed, and the roster of playable Pokemon is downsized to just five. Only five! 
With Aksu being the most broken of them all since the fairy type that was introduced in Generation 6 doesn't even exist. Other problems include paid day 1 DLC, some of the slowest tech speed in the game with no option to increase it, post game is very short unless you shell out the cash to unlock DLC dungeons, and only 144 Pokemon appear in the game overall, omitting a few more that's supposed to be in there. Despite the downgrades, it did introduce one cool mechanic that even after its initial release was carried over to PMD4 and Rescue Team DX. All attacking moves now have a rank system. It's like Final Fantasy II's combat where the more times you use a spell or weapon on an enemy multiple times it gets stronger. Except PMD3 doesn't get rid of the standard level system. As a move is used, it gains progress towards the next rank, and the more it ranks up, the more it grows in power, accuracy, and PP. However, status moves don't have ranks, and moves with set damage or ones that do damage based on factors such as the target's remaining HP can rank up but won't increase in power. Finally, one new feature that's exclusive to Gates to Infinity is the concept of Magna Gates. During the main story, Espeon and Umbreon are two characters you meet that have these cards called Ender Cards, that can summon any dungeon you and your partner Pokemon can venture through. They utilize the power of Ley Lines to open up a dungeon as a means of transportation or entrance. By using different combinations of crafted Ender Cards, they change the flow of Ley Lines to enforce them into new patterns. By taking advantage of the 3DS's AR functions and aiming the camera towards different rounded objects, it transforms them into a Magna Gate, leaving an infinite labyrinth of dungeons to be explored. These round objects can be literally anything from a cup, a circle that's formed by your hand, or if you're one of those degenerates, a person's anus. Any round circle counts. As for the plot, it's not as bad as I remember. I love how it manages to give the spotlight to most of the side characters rather than focusing on the player and partner Pokemon, but it does have a bad habit of bringing in unique plot ideas and elements, only for the game to forget about it when they even have the chance to show their full potential. The biggest example is the partner's paradise. Upon the player entering the Pokemon world by falling out of the sky Kingdom Hearts style, they somehow survive and meet their partner. They were on their way to buy some empty land from a Quagsire, and after purchasing it, the partner explains to the player that their intentions were to build a place where any Pokemon can come and set up their shops, dojos, farming patches, and more. Kind of like a sanctuary, and they ask the player to help. Again, a cool idea on paper, but with how the story is paced, I never had the opportunity to work towards building a large paradise until after the story is finished, so I never got to make the most of growing seeds slash berries or buying cheaper supplies from facilities I've built. Even with its flaws, I do believe that Gates to Infinity does own the right of being a third entry in the PMD series. What the game lacks in overall content, story pacing that will leave some cutscenes awkward to sit through, and an art style that looks like a generic 3DS game, it strives with a fleshed out cast of characters, new interesting mechanics, a good soundtrack with memorable songs, and the Magna Gate feature being clever in using the AR functionality. It's not the strongest start to the 3D era of PMD, but like Rescue Team, it establishes concepts and ideas for the next installment in the series. Gates to Infinity was only able to sell 1.31 million copies in its lifetime. The game turned out poorly among its fanbase, and the series wouldn't get another entry until 2015. This time, Spike Chunsoft was determined to set things right and make it up to the fans by releasing Super Mystery Dungeon. Being released during the 6th generation of the mainline series, Super not only brought back many features that were omitted from Gates, such as the belly mechanic, the deposit box, and party size limitations for certain Pokemon, but included more that made their debut in this game. Some of the most standout features worth mentioning are the personality quiz making a return. But this time, if your type gives you a Pokemon you don't want to play as, you now have the option Option to change to a different one without resetting the game to do the quiz all over again. Alliances are a team attack that warps all party members to surround an enemy Pokemon, then unleashes a simultaneous attack. These attacks ignore ineffective type matchups but also deplete your belly meter, similar to Link moves in Explorers and Rescue Team. The Connection Orb is an item that displays all Pokemon that the player has met over the course of their playthrough. Unlike previous games, enemies in dungeons do not join your party after being defeated. Instead, they become connected by completing mission requests. These requests are then displayed in the orb, which replaces the bulletin board as the interface for taking jobs. Some Pokemon may become connected simply by speaking to them in the hub worlds or at a certain point in the main campaign. Looplets and the Ember system is another feature exclusive to Super Mystery Dungeon. Do any of you Final Fantasy XIV nerds out there love your materials and how they give you certain buffs during gameplay? Well here's that, but simplified for Pokemon fans. Looplets are a held item that is capable of greatly enhancing a Pokemon's natural abilities. Each kind of looplet has a number of slots, each of which can be filled with any Emra the party finds in a dungeon. These gems are this game's materia, and they can give a Pokemon beneficial effects while traveling through a dungeon when equipped. There are 71 different types of Emeralds, each one giving you a different effect. From one that restores your HP when defeating an enemy, to another making you immune to warping or being blown away, and another where it makes it easier to dodge attacks in a pinch, etc. 
Once the leader enters a room with an Emra in it, a countdown will appear over it that decreases at the end of each turn. And if an Emra is not picked up before the countdown reaches a zero, it will shatter into dust that covers nearby floor tiles. If dust is collected from 20 tiles, a new Emra will form. Finally, when you finish a dungeon, any emeralds the party has will disappear from everyone's looplets to avoid bulldozing your way to the end of the main story. So if you like the certain emerald you found in the dungeon, then kiss that shit goodbye because they won't feel so good once it's over. PMD4's main story is mostly split between two parts. The first half takes place in Serene Village, a location where the player meets their partner, while the second half takes place in Lively Town. Like before, the player is a human who's been transformed into a Pokemon with no recollection of their past life aside from the fact that they were once a human. Soon after this, the player is attacked by a trio of Behem. In a bid to escape, the player encounters a Nuzleaf, who helps them escape the Behem, bringing them to Serene Village and taking them in. As the player looks about schooling age, Nuzleaf enrolls them in the local village school, where they meet the partner Pokemon. The partner is a mischievous troublemaker who has a dream of joining the Expedition Society and making a map of the entire known world. After much progress is made throughout the first half of the story, the partner proposes to the player that they both leave the village for Lively Town and join the Expedition Society, despite their fellow villagers discouraging this. Regardless, the duo makes the leap of faith and set off towards their destination where more adventures are waiting for them, all while an ominous threat awaits the Pokemon world in the near future of the plot. Super Mystery Dungeon manages to redeem the spin-off series by bringing back many features seen in previous titles, and a more interesting story with a plot twist conclusion. It also has a consistently good soundtrack to fit each scene and tone of the game, and mechanics that are easy to understand. Some things I didn't like were that PMD4 had a large cast of characters that don't have proper screen time to flesh themselves out fully, and how weird the pacing can be sometimes it makes it harder for me to appreciate most of them. The art style is still the same as Gates to Infinity. Both 3DS games, while they have the advantage of more cinematic shots for certain cutscenes, the world feels generic due to not having a strong art style. Interestingly, Rescue Team and Explorers had the opposite effect with a strong art style but not many cinematic shots due to the game being in 2D and with limitations of the DS. It's still a good game that steps up to the plate after its predecessor, and you should give it a try if you want more of a grander adventure akin to Explorers of Sky. Growing up, this series meant a lot to me and other players within the community. Everyone has a personal favorite entry regardless of their popularity and what aspect they love about them. For most people, it's the stories these games tell and how each one has an identity to call their own with how they present themselves. For others, it's the gameplay and how technical a roguelike game can truly be. While some may enjoy the soundtrack of each entry with how it brings certain emotions in life every time you enter a cutscene or a location. Finally, for some players, it's the characters that caught their attention with how well written they are, and it brings depth, weight, and meaning to the tales they are part of. Pokemon has had a lot of spin-offs throughout its years, and you might like some of those games as much as I do. PMD is one I consider to be better than the mainline games in nearly every possible way, especially Generation 6 and onwards. Whether or not Spike Chunsoft decides to make more in the future, I'll be waiting patiently for a remake of an old game or a new installment in the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series. <laughs> That was a weird dream.